Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Delve. On this episode, we are continuing our dive into the Game Ideas subreddit, where Alex and I look at two particular questions about what happens with legacy characters and what happens when game systems actually evolve, not just the players. Enjoy. Alex has now sent me links. You've been linked in. Oh, no. No, who uses that? So, yeah, okay, here's one that you sent me. Uh, you play as a soldier in a war. When you die, you spawn as a new, different soldier. You can find the body of your previous character and get a quest from it. Thinking of this as a 2D platformer with guns could probably work in other genres. Soldiers would be procedurally generated. Find the body of the previous character you've played at, and you get weapons, loot, etc., but on note, asking to return the body of the dead soldier's parents oh, or, or to a specific part of the map. That's neat. I mean, that's just kind of like a roguelite. A rogue like a uh, roguelike yeah uh so there's... it's permadeath but yeah. once you die you spawn i think spelunky did something similar you know honestly there's a lot of games that have used mechanics like this rogue legacy has something similar to this you you play as one generation character and they go in and when they die the next member in the lineage line goes in afterward and so you're kind of going down and down and down the lineage of this, uh, you know, this heroic line. Yeah. To keep going back into the dungeon. Um, what was the one that I played not too long ago? Well, there was also a, a game I did not like called Void Bastards, which was also oh, okay. similar to that. It, it, it's a rogue game. Um, you're trying to, you know, salvage a bunch of ships in space, and you get to play one of these. Um, prisoners that has been put into this program where that you know hey work release program go on to these very dangerous spacecrafts and hopefully you'll live but if you die uh the data from your pack just goes back to the ship and you get to pick another character that's going to continue on they've done stuff that's similar to this there was another game that i think might be a little bit closer because I think that it had the the aspect of going back and finding y the previous characters. If they were looking at something as like a 2D platformer, it would probably be a top-down, more like a Diablo. Uh, I would do like a side-scroller. Yeah, you do a side-scroller. The corpse run type mechanic where you can go back to your body. I think a side-scroller would be easier, like uh, any of those uh, Metroidvania-type roguelikes and roguelites. Uh, something like that. So you like, I mean, I think the new one is Neon Abyss. If you've seen people playing that, so it's like you get your side scroller, but when you die, you can get your body, and maybe you have a graveyard up top, so you have to return up top with the body or something like that. Yeah, uh, um, Undermine. Yep. Um, that one's a top down though. That's a top down. Uh, that's a little bit more Zelda inspired. Yeah. Either either that, either okay. Zelda or Metroid, or maybe you have a game that you can uh do both. I don't know. That, that'd be more like Mario Odyssey. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a little bit more. Oh my god, can you imagine if they made a Mario Odyssey, but it's literally Mario keeps dying, and then you have to have other members of the Mushroom Kingdom take his place, and you find his hat in the field somewhere, and you have to return it to Princess Peach. <laughs> then it just becomes completely overrun with Mycelia. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think I have a fungus. How'd that happen? <laughs> um, the thing that's interesting about that is I would actually see that in tabletop. If you made a system that was deadly enough that you imagine characters you play are just going to die. I mean, hello. <laughs> hello, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Basically, Alex is your GM. I and so what? Not gonna lie, I've actually had a concept where, uh, for one of the games I have in my mind, where, like, it's really. I think we've talked about it before. Anyways, um, it's like mm. really hard for you guys to like to die. Actually, die. You have to go really out of your way to actually have your fucking whole team die. Yeah. But like, I had the thought, like, 
if your team dies, they're going to send you out to do the same mission again, and you can recover the information of the bodies, but, like, it's not just like, oh, yeah, it's inter- it's because, like, the game I had in mind is, is mission-based and not just, like, character-based and not just specific to whatever. So it's like, yeah, sure. all right, well, Team A, it hasn't reported back, so we're going to send Team B out there to try and recover it and finish the mission. So right. it's similar, because it's like, yeah, you're just going to go ahead and try to do the same thing. But it's like, the point there is, other than like that specific theme that I was going for, it's how do you n- prevent players from just going out to the places of their corpses? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, they know where their bodies are, and they know they're still there, unless some time skip happens. So like, right. either you let them and you give them a reason to do that, or yeah. you, like, suddenly your bodies aren't there, and they're like, whoa, our bodies should be here. What about all the items we had? And it's like, no, someone else took them first. I had a concept that would just be, like, a, a, an interesting concept for a game. If you had a, a crew, like, well, imagine you had gone on this big epic campaign with heroes, and their campaign ended, but then your next campaign were the fledgling adventurers that were going out to try and figure out what happened to those previous adventurers. Yeah. And maybe those, they had turned into the villains, or maybe they had died uh, fighting something that was too large for them, and you had to, you had to, like, find all of them and uh, essentially pick up their stories where they had ended. I thought that that would be an interesting uh, concept. If you had a system... Like, what was the one that was, I think it was Warhammer, but you make, like, a bunch of expendable cannon fodder? Oh, is it Wrath and Glory? Maybe, yeah. It's probably Are you talking about the RPG, or are you talking about... Okay, yeah, Wrath and Glory, I believe, is uh, not one I played, but it was you make uh, Imperial Guardsmen. Oh. And, like, you have a whole squadron of them or something like that, and, like, yeah, you're gonna die. You're, You're Imperial Guardsmen. Sorry, right. you're part of the Astra Mil- Militarium. They, they okay. were branded. <laughs> okay. So, thought process is that you start out with the, with the basic character, and then they die. And then the next one that comes in has to, can recover, you know, you maybe gain experience from what you've learned, and then uh, maybe get some equipment off of you. But then that character is probably going to die <laughs> before they can complete the next part. And you just keep running in with new and new yeah. characters to keep continuing the story along. Uh, you could do that. I think that the problem there is that there is a point where it would start to get super repetitive for <laughs> for people. <laughs> Which is the reason I don't really like roguelikes, by the way. Because it starts yeah. to feel very repetitive. It so. is, unless, unless they're procedurally generated roguelikes where the entire thing changes every time you go and do it. Or if they are rogue lights that I will usually accept because it still feels like you're making some kind of progress each time. Yeah, yeah. I, I have issues with those two. They, they're fun to a point. At, at a certain point, I'm like, I don't really want to go back and try this again. And also because I think it, it gets so random, it also becomes very difficult to get a, a strategy down if you like yeah. that kind of thing. Like, if you, if you like a Dark Souls, which I don't, but if you like a Dark Souls, I'm I'm, you would... I'm allegedly terrible at Dark Souls. You are allegedly terrible at Dark Souls. I'm absolutely garbage at Dark Souls. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> I just I just today actually finished Jedi Fallen Order, which has oh, yeah? some some Dark Souls qualities to it. But the fun part, Alex, something worth noting is if you play Fallen Order on story mode it plays a whole lot more like uh, Force Unleashed instead of Dark Souls, and it's way oh. more fun. <laughs> oh, there you go. Because <laughs> then you get to feel like a badass Jedi, and you get to go in and, and not continuously die and go back to spawn points, but you get to like actually use your lightsaber, you know, f- you know uh, flares and stuff, and, and get to throw your lightsaber at people and watch your Imperial, your, your stormtroopers fall all around you and everything. And it's like, well, this is fun because I liked, I liked that game. Yeah. Force Unleashed was great. I can feel like that now. Um, without, of course, the dark side powers because uh, you're not playing the dark side. But 
it's like it's amazing how much more fun it is when you get to emulate a different game entirely. But if you like Dark Souls st- style games that are all you know laid out and, and you know like that, and you try to find strategies for every enemy that you encounter and everything, roguelikes must be hell to deal with. Yeah, uh, it's it's weird now that you say that. Like, I'm not a huge fan of like the Souls like games and that type of genre of game. Mm. Uh, like, are not my forte, because yeah. I enjoy more of the faster-paced hack-and-slash type yes. games than the methodically slow, well-thought-out and timed, knowing how your controls completely work and timing everything. Yeah. Because um, I was, like, God of War and, and Soul Reaver and Devil May Cry and even, like, Monster Hunter and are a lot faster-paced. I like that style. Oh, and yeah. the slow-paced combat kills me. Because it's like, all right, but this is so slow, and I want to like go fast. Not like mutton, button mash, but like I want to be quick. Um, right. And the games, the combat in those games aren't quick. Aren't quick. But on the flip side, roguelites, roguelikes. Also, I don't want to just like I have Dung Dungreed, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a side scroller roguelite. <clears throat> each floor of the dungeon is kind of shifted each time. They're slightly different every time. But it's like, it's got the same tile sets, it's got mm-hmm. the same types of, like, there's only a set number of rooms, they're laid out in a different order, but, like, the first floor only all of, has all of these enemies. Mm-hmm. And, like, I can expect what to know is, is going to be on the first floor. Uh, and then the second floor is the same thing, and the boss fights are always in the same place, and always the same boss fights. Yeah. So it's like, I like that, and, but at the same time, like, I don't like it because it's like all right i'm just replaying the same level over and over and over again every time i die that gets annoying (laughs) well i think one of the things i liked about uh, jedi fallen order that was a big improvement over dark souls if you fall off a ledge and you just since star wars there's no falling damage what they do is you you fall off the ledge and they just reset you back where you were on on the ledge you don't die and lose your experience at that point and everything. No, they just oh, reset okay. you back on the ledge. I mean, you, you should just going. be able to use your force power to cling to the ledge. That's the thought process, but, uh, you know, I, I just appreciated, like, oh, I don't keep instantly dying when I fall off of things. Right. Thanks for that, because that used to be the... I hated that part of Dark Souls. That made It's like I'm sitting there worried about all of these knights, and then you just you slip off the edge, and then you're dead immediately (laughs) that was always annoying um roguelikes yeah it's just it's a problem with trying to figure out strategy and um what i'm doing it's so random i i have trouble really uh, getting a a mental grasp on what i'm doing and then feels like all my progress is gone i don't mind elements of any of this yeah no i agree i don't mind elements like i like i like the random generation up to a point because oh, it's sure. like, oh, well, every playthrough is now slightly different, which is cool. But then, you know, it's got to be... there. There's a lot of different things. I think, for me specifically, one thing I've realized is I really like um, gear and loot systems and crafting systems. Yeah. So, like, I like being able to customize my gear, uh, which is you played some Inquisitor Martyr. Yep. So they're still tweaking it. But, like, that crafting system isn't so bad, but the the ability to... Uh, re-roll the gear however you want it i really enjoy yeah Um, because i can be like all right everything i'm doing is specifically for one thing uh so you can build how you want which i like Um, yeah but on the other side it's like i also like randomized loot drops that's Mm -hmm. something a system i really like in games yeah yeah well like in in diablo that's yeah. that's random, you know, level building, but I still have progression for my characters and everything, right. you know. Although in Diablo, uh, I've, I've talked about this before, I think, in the Inquisitor Martyr with one of the devs. It's Diablo's, like, set system is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like, the legendaries and sets and all that stuff, it lets you have interesting builds that you can do. The problem with it is it becomes, there's only so many ways you can build in that game. To really like be a, like to push that top tier content, the end like greater rift stuff. It's like yeah. to a point. Then you need to like either super grind for like the primals, or mm-hmm. you need to like use specifically like one set or whatever like that. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it becomes, yes, there are some really good things you can do, but then it kind of just uh, keyholes you right into, like, yeah, you're going to build this way or, or you're not going to win, which right. is more annoying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I hate to get uh, into those, like, rock wall sections of games where it just feels like, you know, you've, you've built to a point, but you can't really progress the way you've built it, and the game didn't account for it. They had this problem when they originally did, what was it, the, uh, oosh, uh, it was Deus Ex, I think it was Human Revolution. There was a whole thing where, like, you can, you can build your character in a bunch of different ways, and you can do stealth, and you can do conversation, and you can do combat, and all of those things. But then they made a mistake. The first boss you have to deal with is definitely combat-oriented. And yeah. if you've built your character any way except for combat, you are going to have the hardest time ever. Yeah dealing with it because they didn't come up with multiple ways to deal with that and they learned right. their lesson when they came back with the the second one right they, they learned that but yeah. um yeah th that was definitely a, a cut point for a lot of people that were like wait a second no this is not what i signed up for i should be able to deal with this in multiple ways based on how i wanted to build my character right um so so that's something. Now, on that topic, it got me thinking, if you wanted to do a, um, like, almost a crafting system, maybe a randomized, like, making things, you know, for weapons and armor and stuff, could you implement something like that as a tabletop mechanic? Because You mean random, like, affixes to oh, items? Oh, like, like crafting and modifying your, your equipment, all of that. I mean, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to. There yeah. are tons of, like, there. you could use, like, uh, gemstones if you get them in games, for instance. Like, you have <laughs> sockets and stuff. I don't yeah. see why that's not a thing you could do. I know in my ideal RPG system that I have from many moons ago that I can't forget, it's like, yeah, you'll be able to augment your spells and abilities based on the skills you have taken. So, yeah. like, if you want to add fire to a sword attack, you can add fire to a sword attack. I, I had this thought, though. Tell me what you think about this. This is just something, like, I was just thinking about off the top of my head is if you had a deck of cards that was your um your weapon then you'd be gambit no <laughs> no 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 the deck of cards was essentially like a forge deck and so when you go to build your weapons or armor or anything you could pick cards from this like like you could have an allotment of 5 cards and you could choose 2 out of them for your stat bonuses or special skills or anything like that. But that would kind of give you the randomized element of it. Um, being able to choose from from an actual deck of cards. And they would actually give you, like, these. this is fortification on your armor. Uh, this is, you know, uh, range increases on your, like, range weapons. Uh, hardened steel, anything like that. But they'd be on cards, and you would have to draw five random cards from the deck after you shuffle them. And that's kind of like the randomized elements. Th that's how you that determine can, the randomized That could be element. interesting. Um, yeah. The issue I have with the cards aspect specifically is that cards will say exactly what they do. So every time you get that specific card, it'll all be, always be the same. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But I, in my mind, I was just thinking of like a bag of runestones. For instance, though. Oh, okay. Like, you draw, like, you put your hand into a bag of, like, 30 runestones. You pull out a thing, and it's, like, a specific rune. Mm. And the rune correlates to a specific, like, ability. Yeah. I think that would be neat. That would be neat, yeah. Also, it would be thematic. Because you'd, be, be... you'd get these, I mean, it would cost a lot to make that, potentially. I think it would look cool. Because you put your hand in the bag, and you pull out a stone, and it's got a rune. Maybe on the back side of the rune, it's got, like, what the translation might be like it might be a sword icon with a plus one or something like that something sure. simple so it's like cool melee attacks get plus one damage or something like that sure. or they could be bigger than small runes and they could like say what they have on them sure or they could be like chits that you pull out of a bag sure that are just really uh thematic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so you could have a uh, a certain cost to essentially generate a randomized rune uh, sure, something like that. Maybe you get some runes of, like, maybe there are runes of uh, types, and then there are runes of power. So, mm -hmm. like, maybe you pull out the sword icon, and then you pull out, like, maybe there's a separate bag. Or maybe there's just one, they're mixed. But then you pull another rune, and you get, like, maybe they're color-coded. 
coded or a plus one plus two plus three plus four or mm-hmm. something like that so you pull out the first one's a sword and the second one's like a purple plus three yeah so you get melee plus three yeah i think yeah. that'd be neat because then then you have these bags that you pull from blindly obviously and you put your hand in you pull a uh, a fireball icon maybe or a flame icon and then a a, a plus two something like that Something weird. Mm-hmm. I think that would be really interesting, and be it'd be also a good way to keep track of it, right? Because then you're going, all right. Here's a put these on like the card icon or whatever, depending on the type of game. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think there's a lot of potential that maybe people are not aware of when it comes to trying to do more in in the line of forging and creating in a tabletop game because you do, usually don't see it there's usually just a a set item list and that's what you got it's kind of it's similar to i wanted to make like a creature creation system that you could kind of just like roll dice on and then generate random creatures like that have random parts and abilities but it's like you still need to build that system so i think that's the hard part people have is building these quote unquote random systems probability generated but they're not really random because there's only a a finite it's finite but like there's hundreds of thousands of combinations and it's hard to come up with those i think as an analog system for a tabletop game because on a video game it's a lot easier in the sense that you kind of just code it in right so you make a list of if a then b you know this is what this ability does, and this has a this percent chance of happening. And it's mm-hmm. you kind of do the same thing for a tabletop, where you go, this is a, a chart of all the potential outcomes I can have, and their percent of happening, or their number, numerical value on the dice, 1 to 20, 1 to 100, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that's still harder um, yeah. to implement for well, whatever reason. Well, any, any time where you would have to code in random generation... It's going to be a lot harder when you're trying to make physical tabletop elements. Otherwise, I think I think part of the issue is that you don't see it in a video game. Mm-hmm. Typically, it's all background. You don't really see it going on. But with tabletop, it's either you need to have a it's physical representation like the bags of runes, mm-hmm. ca- a, deck, a deck of cards, or you need to have a chart. And the chart is like the least... Uh, least likely thing you want to look at. You don't want us there staring at 16 pages of charts. Yeah. It gets no. old. It's not fun. It's, it's boring. It's, it's a lot to take in. The, the only thing I can think of that might actually make that a little bit easier to deal with is if you just used digital as your supplement for the tabletop and you actually just had a, a generator app, essentially, that would... You could do that. Yeah. That takes def- uh, a different expertise as well. It does take a different expertise because you have to be uh, familiar with coding even though you're making a tabletop game. Um, but but it would take a lot of the in-front-of-you elements of the mechanics and it would put it behind a wall where it could quickly you know, generate those elements for you uh, and, and save you a lot of time if it was in the middle of an actual session. That's sort of one of those things where there's a lot of great elements from video games that we would love to be able to see in tabletop, but unfortunately, it's just, if you were to put it in tabletop, it would take so much longer and need so much more, you know, in front of the players and the GMs in order for it to work correctly. Uh, and, And that's the reason why if you were trying to do, like, faction reputations or anything like that, you know, putting it in front of people, you'd need list upon list and too much bookkeeping, as we've talked about several times on the show. Um, so, so as much fun as it would be to have those kinds of elements, there's just a, a certain aspect where it, it becomes too laborious. Um, yeah. This one, uh, moving, moving on. We did good on that. Go us. Go us. I, I think this will probably be the last one for today. Uh, I think so. Actually, I think we've done practically two episodes because it's getting pretty long now. (laughs) Oh, good. But that's okay because this is actually one you suggested and then it's also one that I had seen. So good. So this is good. But this is a game that levels up. So you start out with the core mechanics of your game, including an XP counter, 
If your XP gets high enough, a new element is seamlessly added in repeat. There could also be leaderboards. What I'm getting out of this is your, uh, when you level up, it's not so much you're leveling up, but the game itself is. Was right, that what that's what taking? I got out of that, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. It sounds like the kind of thing that might just increase difficulty as time goes on. Um, I think it would also add complexity. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. But I, I wanted to add, because I saw that one and I read it, I was like, that's interesting, because video games tend to do that mm -hmm. a lot more often. Yeah. I think a lot more often than the uh, original author had mentioned and thought, mm -hmm. uh, because like uh, they kind of introduce new mechanics as you get going through the game until they introduce them all in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they introduce them very quickly, like with, the, with a tutorial. Like, they'll be like, all right, here, you know, this is how to walk, this is how to jump, this is how to do combat. That, I mean, that is technically the game telling you how to do these things, but sometimes they're more like, all right, well, now you've unlocked this element of the game. It's not typically in, like, the, oh, you finished on this mode, now you're adding, gonna go to this mode, and here's a new element the game has. Although that would be a great way to increase replayability. Um, sure would. Uh, yeah. it, it's usually the, oh, you need to get to a certain level before this is introduced to you kind of deal yeah like in world of warcraft you start off with all right here's your spells and abilities just kind of learn how to do combat once you hit level 10 it's you pick a specialization once you hit level 15 uh they might have changed it from the level gap now um mm -hmm. uh, once you hit level 15 you get talents every so many le like every five levels you get a new talent or whatever like that's them introducing like here's core gameplay all right, right, here's core gameplay part two. This is what makes your class more specialized. And then here's core gameplay part three. Here's what makes your character different than every other person in your class specializing the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, like, that is them adding, over time, um, more mechanics to the game. And there have been more and more mechanics added later on for different expansions and different things going on. But at sure. the base, that is essentially what happens there. Yeah, actually, when you think about it, games that level up is just kind of good game design in order to introduce people to your system and all of the intricacies therein. I have seen it in a lot of games where, uh, even in tabletop, since we do occasionally talk about that, but if you think yeah. about, like, if you think about D&D, &D, we'll just take D&D &D as an example, you, when, you're, when you start at level one, you don't have to think too much about the mechanics of the game. You really Not so don't. much. You got to think about like your your hit points. Yeah, you, ha you have to think about your hit points. But in terms of like, even if you even if you're a spellcaster, your options are pretty minimal in yeah. terms of what you can do. You probably have a few cantrips, and good for you. That's pretty much all you're doing. If you're a fighter, even simpler. I hit things with a sword. That's what I do. I yep. go up, hit things with a sword, or I or I shoot a bow. It's not complicated. It's very, very simple. By the time you get to level two or three, however, now you have to pick a subclass, so you have to, you have to pick a, a, you know, a, a, a subtalent. And um, then you get into some more complexity about what your character is and what you can do, and you start to get more and more abilities as time goes on that allow you to have more options in the field. And right. the world chances chances are at that point too, the world is far more complex because you've advanced in the story and there's more there's more stuff going on. There's a lot more gears. Um I've I've seen it plenty in games too. We'll take one of the seminal ones actually that I can think of, which is take Skyrim. Okay. T please. Take, take it my where? Skyrim. <laughs> take my Skyrim. Do you want me to put please. it on the refrigerator for you? Put Skyrim on the refrigerator. <laughs> Alexa. Tell me where, <laughs> tell me where Skyrim is. It's on your refrigerator now. The refrigerator section is up in the mountains of Skyrim. That's why uh, it's so cold. That's why it's so cold. Exactly, exactly. You get up to those, uh, those, those, the peaks. You get to High Hrothgar, and you, you, the refrigerator is up there. It's, it's out the of the end, way. It's the end boss. It's the end boss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, no more party snacks. It's just refrigerator Fred. Yeah, see, no one ever actually got to the end of the real Skyrim, which is just that. That's when That's... the real game begins. <laughs> That's when the real game begins. 
when you crack open a cold one at the top of the throat of the world. Um, but if you think about the, the structure of that, what do you really have to do at the start? Well, you have to build your character, and then you, you don't get executed like they thought you were. But those first few Spoilers. Sections... Yeah, sorry. Sorry for the... For spoilers for an 11-year-old game that, that in literally the first hour that you play, but yes. Uh, but then the, the next section, and this was also similar in like Oblivion and a lot of those games, is you're going through this section where they're basically explaining the different mechanics of the game for your escape. Yep. And so you just have the, the basics, and you'll probably level up, and they kind of explain leveling up and what you get for that as well. But that's that's the basic mechanics. Then the world opens up after that. Yep. And in a lot of ways, that means that your your game really has indeed leveled up to a, a great degree. It's a very steep leveling. <laughs> like, it, it goes from 0 to 60 in exactly one second, because you go from a very linear pathway that you were going down before to literally the entire world is now open. But that is that is essentially the game leveling up to you. Uh, and then, yeah. then you, of course, you as you level up, bigger and bigger challenges happen. What I think, though, that I'm getting out of this that's interesting, that I, I'd kind of like to see in more games, is the idea of, as you get to those levels, that it's not just you specifically or the mechanics for your character, but that the world itself starts in- introducing a lot more elements to it. Yeah. And I think in this case it would be, like, mechanically, perhaps. Like, for instance, if you kept going and they started introducing uh, blocking systems, and maybe the combat gets goes from being a very simplistic one to being a more complex one, uh, that would be, like, a leveling up. Or, or, thought process, if you are more interested to the story and the RPG elements of it, as you get to certain levels... Characters in the world now open up new dialogue chains and missions that um, were not available before. But that happens as you level up. Typically. This is this is true. Yeah, but like, okay, so so it, you're thinking like if the world levels up separately from you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is interesting because you know what this reminds me of XCOM. Oh, okay. Because in XCOM, you're continually trying to get better at what you're doing. But independently of how well you're keeping up with upgrades and your research and, and you know, uh, expanding your base and, you know, getting your heroes uh, ranked up and everything, the world is on a whole different timer. Right. And periodically, as you're going forward, new enemy types present themselves. More difficult variants start to present themselves. Certain emergencies keep popping up. The spaceships like uh, do landings, and there's invasion parties and everything like that. But that that is independent of what you're doing. So you're just trying to keep up with the world that is continuously evolving around you for your enemies, and that's fascinating when you're actually playing it because you realize that no, no, the the alien invasion is not going to slow down because you wanted to take your time, right? No, you you will have your base raided, there will be enemies inside of it, and they don't care if you were not ready for them. They don't care. They're coming at that point. So if you, if you took that concept and you maybe applied it to RPGs more than strategy games, I think it lends itself to strategy games. It does, because especially RTS games mm-hmm. or, or games where... Everything are, are turn-based games where the enemy acts on their turn as well. It yeah. works really well. I think it's harder to implement that in uh, tabletop again, just because right. it's not automatic. You have to actively be doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It makes a lot of things a lot harder on the table, I think. But uh, right. as an idea for you, um, a game I think has a similar idea, a similar concept would be Pandemic. Yes, yes, Pandemic. I do have that. I have played it. Um, and it's, um, but, it can be brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the game, it doesn't necessarily level up and it doesn't necessarily change mechanics, but it gets harder over time. That's the thing. If you're not able to keep up with those, yeah. with those outbreaks, it gets incrementally more difficult because it keeps spreading. 
there was one thing that I was thinking about in terms of a tabletop campaign. I'll throw this idea out to you and, and see what you think that kind of relates to this. Imagine that you are essentially on the run from this like militaristic dictatorship. You, you, you are like the most wanted in this world. Maybe you have information uh, about what they're doing behind the scenes, anything like that. But basically, they are hunting for you now. In and this isn't this is an RPG, and uh, so essentially the GM is playing this like evil empire that is out to get you and try to find you. And as time moves forward in that world, regardless of what your characters do, the GM is figuring out the natural progression of setting up new barracks, new installations, uh, having like inquisitors essentially going to different towns. Uh, where they would they would go, and maybe the players can figure out or or gain some information about where they are. But if they don't, and they happen to decide, hey, I'm going to go over to you know this town over here, Townsville, and uh, that's where the Inquisitors have set up shop. Now you're found out. You have to run away. You have to disguise yourself. You have to essentially hole up till the heat dies down. But the idea that the world itself is continually progressing towards that. And looking for you and hunting you specifically, and it, your characters just have to continually make good choices to avoid it until you're able to do something about it. Right. It, I'm not saying that it's an easy one to figure out, but I kind of figured that if you can kind of procedurally figure, almost like Pandemic, where you know that like we're starting out in these few places and it naturally spreads out from those in patterns that make sense. Um, it, but the, maybe the players are not aware of where everything started, you know, um, sure. that, that, that would be interesting because essentially what you're doing is you are leveling up the enemy every single time, right? Whether the players understand it or not. But do you think that's even implementable in the tabletop? Um, maybe, possibly it might take a lot of bookkeeping, but it might be doable. I think, I think what it would take is a pretty detailed map. That too. Uh, more than bookkeeping, I think it would take a pretty, pretty Im you know, impressive looking map in order to do it. But uh, that was a thought that I just kind of had that feels like it relates a little bit to this. But um, there were a few people that also mentioned a couple games that, uh, uh, like uh, Upgrade Complete, which was an old Flash game, and Evil Land uh, 1 2 that have some similarities to it. So I'm sure there are some games that are a little bit older that maybe utilize that, but I, I don't know of a whole lot of new ones that have similar features to it. Somebody told somebody else that Nier Automata has a feature like that. It No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Having played Nier Automata through to the end, I can tell you it really doesn't. So, <laughs> sorry. Great game. Don't get me wrong. Great game, but it does not have that kind of element to it. Right. So. I, I like these ideas. I think that they have some real merit to them. I, I'm I'm very encouraged about how many people are just thinking about kind of outside the box ideas uh, for gaming. This has been Alex and Nathan go over uh, the subreddit game ideas. This has been an episode of Delve. We ourselves have not leveled up. Uh, in four, I mean, yeah, we have. What in and wait, four years? Four years. You know what? We're gonna be attempting to level up soon, Nathan. What are we trying to level up? We're gonna be attempting to level up our website. Yes, we are going to be uh, leveling up our website. You've been looking into that quite heavily, I believe. Uh, not as heavily as you say, as you intone with that. But <laughs> I've been looking into it. Yes. Yes. Um. So if anyone listening has any ideas, uh, requests, or suggested edits they want for the website, it's going to be updated in the next, probably next couple months. Yes. Yes. Um, to a different, better look and feel, hopefully. The presentation will look a little more impressive, I think, is what we're going for. Uh, a um, nice, yeah. nicer presentation, yeah. It, it'll hopefully be a little nicer, yes. Yes, that is what we are hoping for. And uh, and I, on my end of things, uh, am upgrading my uh, computer game so that I have a uh, a, a monster 
that will live in the corner of my office here that should help me out tremendously moving forward, especially for streaming projects and uh, for, you know, uh, games and audio and video and when we're doing our live shows. So uh, looking forward to that in the next month or so. They're working on building it right now, so everything's coming up Millhouse. Here's a thought, Alex. If anyone wanted to see the website before we go and make all those fancy changes, where could they go right now? Wherever all books are sold. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> Amazon, uh, probably. You can go to <laughs> delcast.com. That's right. Everything that we do is over there, including any of our video and... And uh, any of our books. Any of our books. Any of the books that we have not written yet will be over there. Anyway, you can go and check those out. While you're there, why not check out our Patreon? We put up episodes that are, you know, uh, full, uncut episodes before they go up as regular edited episodes, as well as some other projects that I'm able to do uh, ahead of time. You do your full Citanium Mines on there, right? Full Citanium Mines are actually right now a week to ahead, week or two ahead over there. When I happen to do them, I try to put them out uh, more than a week uh, ahead. So you can find them there. Um, you can uh, usually find videos. You know, I'll try to put anything like that up early over on that site and uh, sometimes put up some special stuff. There are some things that I don't really put out on the regular website anyway. Just interesting ideas that I wanted to throw out there anyway, and, and we'll put those up on Patreon as well. So, worth checking out. And as always, thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Nick, as well as our special Discord Shiny Level patron who helped us get to level 1 Discord server, Drunk Paul. While you are online, hey, maybe check us out on social media. Uh, we are on the thing called Twitter, which is still alive. Is <laughs> it, Sarah? Is it? I guess so. You can find me on there. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and our show is at Delve Podcast. Yes, and so uh, Delve Podcast is definitely the main account for the show and for the website, but we usually also retweet stuff out uh, on our personal accounts. Go ahead and check that out. Anytime that we post on the website, you will get a notification if you are uh, linked in on our Twitter or on our Facebook group. So that will conclude our epic that is uh, game ideas from Reddit. It's always scary when we look on Reddit, isn't it? Yeah, Reddit's a scary place. You have to know what you're looking for, and you have to get into a subreddit, because if you just looked at the regular Reddit page, you would, you, you'd have no faith in humanity left, I don't think. <laughs> but this, this was a good one. I'm glad that we got uh, to do one of these, because it's been a year and a half or so since we did the last one. Was it really that long ago yeah since we did tabletop game design as the thing wow this year's fly flown right by i know it's been a decade of a year let me tell you sure has been <laughs> sure has uh and so uh until the next time that we uh see you it will probably be 2012 uh 2025 or something like that uh but It'll be, actually uh, 2077 2077 hey yeah hey we're gonna experience that i started thinking about this the other day is if video games tell me anything uh 2076 is going to be horrible and then 2077 is going to be way better <laughs> oh okay because if if we if we go by the logic fallout 76 happens in 2076 then uh cyberpunk 2077 happens in the year 2077 all right then Actually, I don't think Fallout 76 happened. I think that's like 2276 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you're 200 years old. Well, I can't use that joke anymore. Oh, well. Well, until we see you in either 2076 or 2077, thank you for joining us on this episode of Delve in the year 2020. From all of us here at Delve, well, basically the two of us, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.